Are we on? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, firstly, thank you so much. Thank you to Celia and Kunstens Hus and Thomas um, for making this possible. But also a really huge thank you to Daniela um, for the program and also for coming. Um, you are on a pretty crazy itinerary, I think, of a kind of European grand tour. And um, we were able to kind of snag you for, for this event, which is, um, I've been, um, as Celia mentioned, I think it's been a pretty extraordinary 24 hours, um, but it's also been a kind of extraordinary couple of years, I guess we could all agree. And I think one of the um, one of the most inspiring things for me, to be honest, in the last couple of years has been particularly another screen and discovering um, some extraordinary filmmakers through that project. Um, and I know just from speaking to people in town and kind of the light that came on in their eyes when I told them that you were coming and that this program was happening, that 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 um, that really has been the case for a lot of people. Um, I thought what we could do, because um, I'm sort of aware of time, and I think I sort of have a feeling there are probably also kind of questions in the audience, but maybe we can talk just kind of briefly about the three films, um, and then just open out a little bit and talk about another screen and another gaze, and then kind of throw it open. But um, uh, we should say that all all these works that we saw, we've um, kind of put them together as this program, but they were all um, part of separate projects, they were part of another screen, a part of the screening platform. Um, but do you want to just say something? Maybe we can just go through them one by one quickly and just talk, for example, to begin with about the, the first film we saw, the, the Sarah Maldraw film, which is actually the most recent. It has this patina of looking much older, but actually it's, it's from 94. It's from uh, well, thank you. S oh, is this, is this one working? Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. It's really lovely to be here. And it's, I didn't expect there to be so many people because I actually thought that Midsummer was um, celebrated like it was in Sweden. And actually, Mike didn't know... Uh, <laughs> I just imagined everyone would be outside, so it's really nice uh, to see you here. Um, yeah, so actually the first film... Oh, I, I want to say, first of all, that the first film, uh, it was a new scan that I haven't seen before, um, and it's not that much better quality, but it has um, when you see Senghor reading out uh, the Wolof po um, poetry, that wasn't translated before, and I think it poses some interesting questions about subtitling. Um, and the Fonza Woods film, uh, it's the European restoration premiere of that film. <laughs> Um, uh, and yeah, it's only just been restored and actually Fronza hasn't uh, even seen this. Um, that's because she can't really use a computer. <laughs> she could have seen it. Anyway, so I just sent her a, a text of it, um, a photo, and yeah, it's beautiful. And then uh, the Lola Pigal film, uh, it's beautifully conserved by uh, INA, which is the Institut National uh, Audiovisuel in Paris. And I think uh, I only mentioned that because... Um, these films, were, uh, the, the Lolo Pigal film is part of, a, as Celia said, part of um, a, a TV show called... Sorry, I'm not answering. I'm actually just talking about all of them now. Uh, so it's called <laughs> Jim Dam Dum, uh, which is... It, the, the title breaks down to the fact that it was shown on a dimanche, on a Sunday, uh, for Dam women, um, with the hope that some dumb uh, men would also tune in. <laughs> Such a pathetic <laughs> name. <laughs> but um and actually I just these shows are just absolutely incredible like um I got they sent when they sent me over the interviews they sent me the whole episodes and like they were such a visual treat that I sneaked um little clips from uh before um like for example this this ep this episode has um a performance by Sandy Shaw the British uh singer it was from the 60s uh singer and um also Nikki de Sandfal the sculptor um a portrait of her as well and it just like speaks to this amazing time for television um and th these films are incredibly um uh restored but um by the Inatec um but no one really knew about uh this television show and even Juras scholars like maybe it was a footnote in a couple of places but no one had for some reason really considered these as um pieces of art in their own right I think because of the 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 view we have of television as a medium um anyway uh back to <laughs> back to the Maldoro film actually that wasn't part of another screen that was um the impetus for another screen was um, when Sarah Maldoro died in May 2020, as I oh know April 2020, from coronavirus, as Celia mentioned. Um, so I'm saying your name in a French way. I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, likewise. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so we showed uh, we we had a roundtable discussion, um, and this was like 
I, d I didn't even know how to use Zoom, really. It was like May 2020. I contacted Madara's daughters um, because what happened was that um, I saw that she died and uh, I'd read so much about her, but barely seen any of her films. Um, there's a film, Samba Zanga, which is actually her second feature, but people think it's the first because the first one, Guns for Bantu, is lost um, and it still hasn't been found. Um, the daughters are actually hunting for it still um, and going to all these countries looking for it, which is fascinating. Um, but Samba Zanga has been on YouTube for a while and all of these like Pan-African scholars um, who, for whom uh, Maldoral was such an important uh, name, um, but hadn't they hadn't necessarily seen many of her films. But this was like what was so fascinating is people knew about the project of Maldoral. They knew about the constellation of of names um, of intellectuals around her because she really brought people together. From uh, actually, she shot some footage for Chris Marker's Sans Soleil, Sans Soleil, Soleil but it wasn't credited. Um, and but she was really good friends with Chris Marker. She was really good friends with um, oh my god, what's his name? now the guy that was a um was the director oh um, michel laris um he's the director of the musée de l'homme so it's kind of like this is a very colonial uh, ethnographic museum but she was really good friends with the the white director of that and then also all of as you saw in the Damas film, all of the, net, the sort of network of um, black intellectuals, um, poets, um, who she sort of brought together. I mean, they weren't just brought together by her, but for example, there's two portraits of Césaire, um, who you saw in the film, who's a very, um, I'm sure you've heard of him, important uh, uh, poet, Martinican. Um, in one film, uh, one of the portraits of him, you get Maya Angelou um, talking about Césaire and reciting one of his poems, As You Go Down the River. Um, the river actually in that case in um, Miami and here you've got the river and the poetry being read over it um, but back to the <laughs> sorry I just like I'm so unfocused in the way I speak I'm really sorry and I speak really fast so tell me if you don't understand anything I'm saying but <laughs> um, yeah so so like the uh, another screen was started last year and not in 2020 but we organized this round table uh, me and Yasmina Price, who I hadn't met, but she's an incredible um, scholar at Yale who works on um, black experimental film. And we put together this roundtable discussion on Zoom. This was before we were fatigued by Zoom. Um, and we brought together like various um, black uh, academics and uh, someone that had a very influential film blog um, called African Women in Film. And uh, and I brought, yeah, we brought together like a couple of um, an actress who read out uh, some texts that had been very influential, one Emmy Césaire text and one Frantz Fanon text. And it just was like actually just the most incredible uh, event. And I don't usually say that about something I've done, but I did it with a bunch of people and it was just the most moving thing. And we had her daughter speak at the beginning. And what, and uh, I didn't actually, we didn't actually put those films on a platform. What we did was um, I asked the permission of the daughters um, that we could circulate the films just to the people that were gonna take part. Obviously, they could easily share the passwords with others, but for two weeks before the event, we had, um, I just put them on a Vimeo with the password and they were viewed like thousands and thousands of times. Um, and because I thought it was just important um, because Madara was spoken about so much, but her film work hadn't really been viewed. Uh, um, so people viewed it before the event, but it wasn't on, on a platform. But it was the impetus, that sense of community created um, by virtue of this round table, which we both come from <laughs> London film scene. And uh, yeah, I, I've never really experienced that in, in the London context. Um, and it really felt to me like the first encounter I'd ever had with this like international cinephilic community um, who came together f by virtue of something sad <laughs> but there was it was such they had such an energy it had such an energy that i wanted to recreate that in some small way with another screen uh, okay sorry no th thank you that's um <laughs> i'm sorry to cut you off that I, I i just wanted to mention also because some of you the first to arrive i think maybe got this handout uh which is a an interview actually so there's there's a kind of connection in the program that that um uh margaret Jura it does this interview with um Maldoror, uh, which is really extraordinary i think and uh, and uh, just say if you didn't get a copy of it, you, c you can email Celia afterwards, and we'll very happily share. Her. And which was actually translated also by you, Daniela. So that's something we may come back to. Um, maybe maybe we can just because um, because in a way that there's um, there's so much to unpack with each of these films and these filmmakers. 
and I guess we will come back to the way in which the platform itself is trying to, to create a frame for them. But maybe we could just speak briefly about the Fronza Woods work. So Fronza Woods, for example, is, an, is a filmmaker I knew absolutely nothing about, but it's such a kind of extraordinary piece. Can you just say uh, say something about that? About how did you come across that, and what what was the background to to uh, Fanny's, uh, film. Fanny's film? Film. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't actually remember i think i got into like a really long email chain with uh fronza but i can't even remember oh okay i do actually remember so i'd not always known her name and then actually this um okay this is like a bitchy thing but anyway i'll just carry on um <laughs> um yeah so she you know you can see the subtitle of this film is invisible women and there's a blog uh in based out of London, I think, called Invisible Women. And I think it might be named after her or it's a coincidence, but they interviewed her. And then, um, yeah, and it was like, we found out about this woman director and like, her, f she's black and her films are n have never really been shown that much, which isn't true. I mean, actually they did a quite a good like festival circuit at the time. Um, both of them. And also in 2017, um, they were shown at the BAM Cinematheque in, in uh, New York by uh, Nellie Killian, one was one of the programmers, I can't remember who the other one was. Um, and so this, in this blog, they were sort of talking about like, the, the fact that they'd like sort her out to try and speak to her and stuff. And this, um, I talk about this all the time and Mike's probably bored of it because he's read it like when I said it before, but I am really skeptical of this idea of like um, an archeological dig for like women filmmakers. And I found the framing on that women's feminist uh, blog kind of cynical, even though Fronza herself was using the, the um, phrase invisible women for this project, which was meant to be um, several films, but of course her career was cut short as Celia mentioned in uh, the piece of writing that's on another screen. Um, yeah, like there were many different circumstances that meant that she just never made a film again after this one. And it's true that the appreciation of them, the fact that that's now on the Criterion channel um, for the, from, the, from like two months ago, that it's just been restored by women make movies, like obviously he speaks to this um, revival of interest in a very small um, body of work, two films. Um, but yeah, so then, and then she wrote um, this amazing piece of writing, which I think was published on Milestone, which is a distributor. Um, Fronza wrote this amazing piece of writing about, um, and it was something that I'd been writing about a bit when people asked me to write, uh, interviewed me or um, I wrote this like very angry letter for the Cahiers de Cinema uh, about the London film scene um, d after the creation of Another Screen. Um, and she, so Fronza herself wrote this like open letter or something about being what it's like to be rediscovered. And she talked about people, programmers suddenly coming to visit her in rural France where she now lives. And were like, I don't know, like the, this, this actually this journalist from the Cahiers de Cinema came and like, she just, she was just like, it's very weird to have this suddenly to have this like male young male journalist from the Cahiers de Cinema like come and interview me like 50 years after I made my last film or 40 um, and I just found it so honest like I just found because um, she is grateful but like why should she have to be so grateful and I just find if you can read the interview an interview with her on um, another screen and it's like my favorite interview I've ever read with a filmmaker because it's just so much about uh the granular, like the, it's very granular in terms of, and it's very honest in terms of like everyone that's let her down, but she's not bitter. She's just like very direct. Um, and I don't know, it's very uncensored. Um, and it's very like mundane in places, but I love it. Like, <laughs> and um, so I wrote to her being like, I love what you said here. Like, I hate the notion of rediscovery. I would be really pissed off too if someone came to visit me when I was like 78 and um, was like, I saw your film from the 80s and I, I rediscover, I'm going to rediscover you and t send out the information, send out the news to everyone that you exist. And then, um, we got into this really nice email chain and then I felt a bit embarrassed to say like, so can we show your films? Uh, and <laughs> I, I was too scared because we were just, we built up a rapport that wasn't really based on, I just, it was actually based on like anger about a lot of things. And uh, she's really, if you ever get to be an email correspondence with Fronza Woods, like you get um, sent like the daily New Yorker, New York, New Yorker cartoon like every day. But you also might get some personal emails. Um, and <laughs> anyway, um, we just, I just got an email from Fronza. <laughs> second um and I'm gonna send her yeah I don't think she even remembered it was tonight anyway um 
that is how uh and it was a yeah the copy that we showed on another screen wasn't this one it was one that had embedded french uh subtitles and it was the best version but it really was a really poor copy but actually uh that brings me to <laughs> the idea of uh what is good to show online and what isn't and interestingly uh well not interestingly just weirdly, I felt like much more comfortable with the idea of showing televisual works um, like Jurassic's because that's something that isn't ever shown as a, as a program in a cinema. And partly because of yeah the form of it, the fact that they're very small interviews, um, that made me feel more comfortable than showing something like Franz's work, um, which should be, I think, viewed in a, in a cinematic or a gallery space. Um, but these television works, ironically, had been so well preserved. And this is not the case, as we know, for like Channel 4, which doesn't even have an archive or something like in the UK, like so many people want to go and see what was being shown. Um, but I think it's really difficult to access the archive, even if there is one, whereas Ina is um, much more open. Anyway, that's really off track. But, it, <laughs> but it's I, it's so, I mean, the, I think especially those two are in such kind of amazing dialogue, those two films, seeing them back to back, um, the Jura and the Fronza Woods. Um, but there's something so, like, I, I don't know if it's true for other people, but for me, you know, in my education, so on, like you would learn about Dura mostly as a as a as a modernist novelist or as the author of The Lover, um, and I think sort of this discovery, you know, for me of of this these kind of interview work, which doesn't really fit a category. It's not journalism, really. It's not. It, it's many of these also exist in written form, um, but there's something so extraordinary. It kind of shows up the limits actually of what we think of as interviews and other formats. Um, I, I, could you could you say a bit more about because you're because you're you are someone that you're actually quite engaged with you're working on another translation now actually but can you just say a little bit more about um, about this particular aspect of her work this kind of interview uh, mode that she that she employed you know I guess throughout her career really yeah I mean wait is it um, she's not here is she the duress translator that you invited. No, no, that's fine. I'm just like, I would actually be more nervous to talk about duress if there was, yeah. uh, but I, <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad. No, um, <laughs> this actually preceded um, L'Amont, which won the Prix Goncourt. Um, and actually, so this is before she becomes like duress in inverted commas, like this icon. Um, so it's quite fascinating actually to see her a little bit more humble. I mean, she's still in her signature like glasses and she's still very much a character but she's not this actually relates more to her journalistic work that she did in the 50s for the Nouvelle Observateur which is a was a left-wing is still a left-wing newspaper um where she profiled like uh street cleaners I mean it was very much like talking to the every woman the every man um which is the case for a lot of these interviews um and I don't actually I never I've never actually no I'm pretty sure she chose her own subjects I mean I don't know how Dim Dam Dom approached her, um, like what the the task she was given to do. But like uh, as part of this series, she interviewed Jeanne Moreau, uh, who's actually evoked in this uh, film, who's uh, I'm sure everyone knows, like a very famous um, new wave and post new wave uh, French actress um, and who was her friend and, and starred in some of her later her films. Um, and I think her first film was, okay, don't quote me, 72. But it was, she had not made a f yet made a film uh, when she was, interviewing these people um but then she also interviewed like w it's really fascinating so um there was this one with the prison governess like the only um head of women he woman head of a prison um in france at the time and like there she get like she grapples with um prison abolition she b grapples with like um uh, women prisoners and like should they be actually be in prison she grapples like it's just incredible because now we're talking about abolition um of prisons in the last few years again it's come back around uh, obviously it's Angela Davis and etc have um have always been relevant texts but like um yeah and she really she really challenges this woman and you can see with Lolo um she she's not easy with she's not she doesn't like patronize her in any way but you can tell that there's empathy even when she's posing like difficult or being very persistent about certain things when Lolo's not playing ball when she's like not answering the question um but i think like the i don't know i just like what i find really touching about it is um she doesn't yeah she doesn't patronize her at all and she i just i love the moment when she asks her like what are you reading at the moment and it turns out lolo's reading uh, reading up about unions like i just find that so brilliant because lolo's never be probably never been asked these questions and actually she never she didn't leave uh striptease she even though at the end she says she will she was actually photographed. Um, there's the photos you can find them on another screen. Um, 
yeah, um, because we keep the pages up even when the films are taken down. Um, I think in the 80s, um, she was photographed um, by for this fashion magazine um, because that person had seen, the photographer had seen her, um, this interview and went to find out what had become of her and she was still stripping. <laughs> Maybe this is a good moment just to zoom out and actually talk about uh, another screen. Um, so it's been going since kind of mid-2020, is that right? No, uh, March later. 2021. Right. Yeah. So it was kind of instigated by the this experiment in 2020, but the but the first programs weren't weren't released until 21. Um, and you've had a really extraordinary variety of um, artists and filmmakers who you've profiled there. Yeah. Um, they, I think, initially they were up shorter, is that right? Like a week or something. But then they mm. they're kind of up for a month normally now. Yeah, that was. I mean, I feel still ambivalent about it. Um, not that we're po not that we're post pandemic, but we're acting like we're post pandemic. But um, yeah, I kind of just am like, what is the place? Like, what is this now? Does anyone even engage with this? And they, and I think it's, and now I think it's more for people who don't live in met, um, met metropolises. Um, we have, I mean, we have such a worldwide audience. That's what's really lovely. And, and we subtitle the films in like seven languages because we have a massive, for example, we have a massive Japanese audience. We have a massive Brazilian audience. Um, and that was created through another gaze. Like we had this audience from another gaze. People would um, Google translate the, the articles and stuff. But um, I don't know why. Oh, Mandy. So yeah, yeah. At the beginning, the, this is boring though. It's just the fact that like at the beginning, I didn't really film you know streaming films was still pretty at the beginning of 2021 obviously we'd had a year of pandemic already but um something like mangini Cecilia mangini uh, an italian filmmaker from uh made films in the 50s 60s and 70s um i'd never seen like something like her film streaming i mean it was still at that time we had like a, a year ago i you know movie netflix la, 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 they were still the main players and then eflux i don't know when they started showing films but my vision for another screen was always like i find movie really <laughs> sorry i realize now we're in the one of the locations of the worst person in the world which is distributed by movie so i hope I hope uh, no one's ears burning here, but no, I find movie like really uninspiring. I think the framing is really cynical and um, <laughs> I don't care. And I think like I just um, when you go on the website and it's just like you have this like 30 films and you click on one and you get this black box and it's like then you have to go and look, you know, maybe do extra research, whatever. But I just like I really wanted um, a space that was more like, well, nice nicely designed but also um it was more like a gallery where you could sort of jump around between different works and do and read the wall texts um alongside them or before or after but that didn't mean that like whereas like Mubi has Mubi notebook which is um it's criticism criticism platform so you can go and read about how wonderful the worst person in the world is because they obviously have bought this film and want everyone to watch it but like the idea of the the, the texts um <laughs> the idea of the text on another screen weren't actually um positive or negative criticism they were really just contextualizing these films that not much had been written about and also new translations of interviews and stuff like this so like every time i show something i look at all the stuff that have been has been published about these films before um for example there was like this amazing discovery of a text um for simone barbes which is like, incredible you can just go on another screen and honestly the password's like so easy to guess like simone barbes is just like the password simone or lowercase mangini it's just like mangini or lowercase like fronza if you want to watch it again in the worst quality it's just fronza and i should really change the passwords but um it's kind of really <laughs> anyway so <laughs> simone barbes um this lowercase simone uh oh no sorry sorry i didn't know my password so Lo simone barbes is like a, a french film about um uh, a poor a, an usher in a porn theater um and i found from the calle de cinema issue um again like this is like another it just speaks to the fact that these films aren't forgotten like or, or haven't just been discovered like there was a whole issue of Calle de Cinema which had Simone Barbes on the front and it had like four articles dedicated to her and one of the best things that I think we published on another screen text wise is like this amazing um, piece of writing by a French actress who was also a critic and uh, Danielle Darieux um, who wrote this text about um, uh, going to visit going to interview like five women um, ushers in five different par like Paris cinemas and it's like very funny and um, yeah again it's all about labor just like uh, <laughs> these films um, anyway just in terms of the so you, you mentioned I uh, described it really beautifully that the it's when you go to another screen in a way what's maybe surprising from a kind of movie situation so like you say with movie 
you know there's the there's the uh, the link straight away and then there's like a tiny text box that you have to kind of forcibly expand to find anything more about it where it's like you you, you might have to scroll down quite far on on that screen to, to get to the videos because that because there's a there's a there's a commissioned essay or a translated essay or that you know the context is very very important um yeah people are always like how do i watch the films i'm like you just have to scroll like a tiny tiny bit like do i really <laughs> need to hold your hand <laughs> anyway sorry um could you just say about the because we, we you've mentioned already like some of the other things that are on there and there's there's um Carol Rusopoulos and Delphine Seyrig works there's um uh recently you had these um uh a film by Palestinian women like uh, different filmmakers Palestinian filmmakers um but in terms of like a selection criteria um it, how do you, how does that work is it how opportunistic is it is it kind of just coming across things or how 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 kind of systematically or how far ahead are you thinking with that Oh, like, not at all. I don't really know. I just, like, um, I'm not really sure, actually, because I don't really ever think... I just read something, and I'm like, oh, maybe I could show that film, and I see what kind of quality it's in. But no, like, if I was actually better, I would sort of be in touch with archives and be like, what do you have for me? But I... I don't know, I just like can't really, I just don't want anyone to do that work for me. So I just sort of like, if I read about, um, I'm just trying to think of an example. Oh, um, yeah, one that's coming up. Uh, like, um, yeah, one of them actually, I mean, so another gaze, like the idea, some, some of the, pieces of writing on another gaze are about like uh, films by women that are, are not even viewable like and I think I said this yesterday in Tron Times so it's very boring but like I found I feel like um, another gaze has like quite a duty now having an audience um, quite a, yeah a readership when it's the first piece of writing a thorough well-researched writing about uh, a woman filmmaker um, and you know when you google that person's name and another gaze is the first um, search result or something I yeah I kind of felt uncomfortable about that and I wanted a way to for these um, works to be shown so that in order that other pieces of writing surface or in order that people could counteract the analysis um, or think through the criticism um, in those pieces. Um, so like, for example, we've got one coming up, which is, um, which you saw, which I sent to you, uh, a Polish um, film about Alan, okay, I can't even, I can't say her name, Alina Szczurowicz, uh, a famous um, Port um, a Polish <laughs> sculptor. Um, and, a, and someone did a piece of writing about that for another gaze, like a very long, amazing uh, piece of writing about this film. Um, and so I just was like, oh, it would be like incredible to show it with the essay. And I haven't done that before, but like it's just been restored and it's gorgeous and la la. So no, I don't really know. It's not really, um, I don't, I don't know because I don't actually really want to be doing this. Like, I don't really want to do another screen because it's just, it takes up so much time and it's like, <laughs> no, but I don't, I'm not joking. It's just like, it takes up so much time and it's like, I don't know with the pandemic and stuff. I'm just like, who's actually viewing this? Um, I don't p get paid like this is thank you for this invitation because like it's a bit of money for me that's like really nice but honestly like I just I I just like when we just we just did a Sandra here um password Sandra lowercase um which is <laughs> actually <laughs> um uh, Mike co-founded Lux in London it's distributed by Lux so I'm sorry <laughs> that <laughs> to give out that publicly but um I just it, that one was like ridiculous because it was so expensive Lux is so expensive Mike it was 2,500 pounds to get to show these films and I, and I was just like I'm not getting paid to do this I'm sp putting 2,500 pounds forward to show these films for free <laughs> to the whole world <laughs> like it's ridiculous <laughs> but um yeah I just like I wouldn't want to do it any other way I would never want it, there to be a paywall or anything but I am just like it would be cool if like someone could throw me a few hundred pounds to like do this labor <laughs> open call to the audience um <laughs> I, I there's actually i have i have a few other questions but i, I yeah, actually it's I, really boring now. i'm sorry if anyone wants no, to jump I in I, actually i think it's really important because i think this is something that that i really felt was that another gaze which you can buy copies of afterwards and another screen projects really big i think you know, that there is a feeling of like that you can just see the amount of labor and it feels like there must be this kind of enormous amount of resources behind it. But but it is, it's really you and a handful of other people doing it for kind of love and honor, as Hollis Frampton would say. So it's like really a, um, it's kind of an extraordinary thing. And I, I want to ask, because I, I want to throw it open to the audience, but I have one other question about that because just the, my sense is that it, it has, um, over the last few years, obviously there's already been the journal since 2016, mm -hmm. but that it's when it's kind of stepped up to another level with another screen is in terms of visibility we're talking about the number of views 
I just wonder if that you talked a bit already about the sense of responsibility, but what 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 is changing for you in terms of you know the it gathering momentum and gathering visibility? Are you thinking about trying to scale up, trying to fund it differently, or do you, does it just make you think? Yeah, how how are you? How do you? How does that change your sense of what it is that you're doing? Um, I so I mean the motivating factor is really just like um, as you can tell from my very negative personality and attitude, like it's really just a reaction to um, the way women's films are being well as uh, the the notion of uh, as feminism gains ground, uh, obviously rightfully so as Roe <laughs> versus Wade was overturned, but a certain type of uh, feminism in more academia or in in critic in criticism i'm actually talking about more i'm talking about popular feminism and the way that that's now been uh brought over to film programming and film criticism um i find a lot of the framing like really really depressing and and cynical and not very thorough and i think um Another thing that I think that I try and do with another gaze and another screen is like to engage with history and to engage with the fact that so much of what we think is new uh, has been written about since at least the 70s um, in terms of, yeah, even something like uh, uh, women in prisons. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think a lot of um, film criticism what's, uh, is very ahistorical. And I think our editing process is very... Um, harsh i think if any of our writers are <laughs> yeah, they'd be like it's like a boot camp um but it's like it's always like challenging um notions of newness um and that's really important to me i think so it's not really yeah i don't know i mean the funding it's it's ridiculous like i was talking to so it's actually just two of us that do the the journal and it's just me that does another screen but um missouri my co-editor she she reads the te rereads the text and stuff um, and she's brilliant but we were just talking about it because she's a novelist i make money through translation which um you were like that's a famously un badly paid a job isn't it and i was like yes <laughs> that's true um so yeah anyway but um um yeah we were talking about it and we were like we're trying desperately to get funding but then we were like maybe we should just see this as something that we do now that we are both getting other work like maybe we should see something as, as something we do as like maybe we shouldn't view it that way maybe we should never try and get funding because the thing is that with funding the i think it's like it's it can be compromising like it can it could depending on the funder it could really like compromise our us in some way even even just making a commitment to a certain amount of because we both just do our other paid work um we put that first so like for example um yeah we can't commit to doing two issues a year it's meant to be biannual and it's like but yeah we're just not always going to be able to do that so i think that that's i think that it's chaos is like part maybe part of its charm uh <laughs> so sorry that's not really answering your question but uh yeah no, I think no should, money uh, in the arts like fascinating i just was hearing like a lot about what you're saying about artist unions in norway and um stipends for artists and like obviously very different in britain but it's one of the reasons we don't get funding in from the arts council in england which is like i think quite a f uh, flawed uh structure anyway is because it's not British focused enough. Like that was one of the criticisms we got. Like this isn't doing anything to like sell British film to a worldwide audience. And I was like, that's because Britain has rubbish, like quite rubbish films mostly. <laughs> Apart from all the Lux artists, <laughs> um, Good, well qualified. <laughs> anyway, uh, sorry, <laughs> but we should say just because I want to, I want to throw it open. I want to just say, just on that note, y um, you do take donations, though. I think it's kind of important that it is like a. <laughs> that it's a yeah, my hat is up. <laughs> 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 The organisation <laughs> takes donations. Um, I would prefer card than Krona because I'm leaving. <laughs> if you ask. Are there are there um, questions or comments from from out there in the dark? We don't, I don't think we need to. We can do a mic, but you could also just shout or whisper. Any. <laughs> yeah this is like yeah well it's hard because like a lot of these women are dead and like i would have like <laughs> spoken to them but like honestly yes you do pick on up on something like that's like actually a big flaw is like me wanting to make best friends with these like older women who <laughs> who have a lot of free time because they're not making films anymore and like this is yeah i'm not very professional like i <laughs> like sadly i would rather they had the money and the means and if they wanted that to make the films but yeah like it's true that I do I think it's more and I, 
and it's not even I don't know it's it's complicated because I don't really talk to these women about their films we just like share gossip and and like with Franza it was as I said like it was a it was talking more about the cynic like being more cynical about the way people are talking about her um so yeah I think that is really that is really interesting and I think yeah and I think um I don't know just thinking about this show that recently opened and I don't know a, a big curate like a big curated show um which has yeah a, a lot of um, films by women a lot of um who and and you go through the archive often like uh, distribution I mean people know this I'm sure but like you're not always in you're very rarely actually in direct contact with the filmmaker like the filmmaker often most often doesn't have their the rights to their own films which is a whole other issue um but I think I don't know it's like I don't yeah I love posting um publishing the interviews with the women because I think one thing that um fascinated me from the beginning and actually when another gaze started and you actually saw some of these um there's a section on the another gaze website which is called portrait of a filmmaker and they're their films of um their little portraits of women filmmakers and yeah portraits um and what was nice about that is that i was able to include clips of their work uh into which is which punctuates the interviews a bit um and what i i wanted to do that because i we have um this was more of a, it was a bit more of like naive or like an early thought in, yeah, like when I was, yeah. It was more like I wanted to be able to, for younger filmmakers or women filmmakers to be able to see what a woman filmmaker looked like. And I think now I wouldn't put it, I wouldn't state it like that at all. But like when you think of um, auteurs, like male auteurs, and you kind of know a bit about their personality or like something wild they did or like when they went out and got drunk and like smashed up this bar in Venice, but like it was so cool because they're like Jean-Luc Godard. He didn't actually do that but I just like I just imagined um I wanted to like see something of these women's characters and like um these portraits on online like there are some yeah really like um I hate these words like fierce no there's really like really really tough um interesting women and some a couple of whom are like very self-deprecating and I find like the issue of women's confidence are very very uh, fascinating and also humor like whether a lot yeah some of them weren't didn't have any humor but some of them did and I don't know and like um so I don't know it's not that and I don't want I don't want like I never you know I never think that um I'm not I obviously like anti um the biography like work but um, by women being read through biography because that's something that actually happens much more often with women um but at the same time it's like why not hear like let's hear from these women because so many of the women uh like Cecilia Mangini the first one that like, we were going to go to Rome and interview her and then she she died and like I don't know it's just like and there's not that many inter I think it's so important to interview these women while they're alive I mean we're just losing we're just like shedding these like Varda and Maldera and all these people and Ackerman just have all died in the last few years and it's like I think it is really important uh archivally to to speak to them um but yeah sorry no that's great thank you um I want are there other questions do you want to ask who the ones that didn't have a sense of humor were <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's something that I would love to write about. Uh, and I, yeah, I I'd very, very rarely do write and I would like to write about it. But um, I guess I, I don't know, it's like this idea of um, rediscovery. I mean, that's not newness, but it is, um, it's putting the person that's done that rediscovery, the rediscovering in the position of power. And I think that that's what I mean. I think it's, um, yeah, it's like a lack of citation. It's it's sort of um, not crediting the work that's been done before by the archive. Like, how do we still have these access to these works? It's through restoration, archive, um, the writing that's been done um, before it. And I think I've seen a lot of dishonesty in programming uh, over the past few years in terms of people not uh, giving that credit. Um, but in terms of like the fetishism of the, of the new or like, I think it's just all branding again. And I think feminism has become like 
so it's never been so neoliberal it's never been so connected to branding and, and marketing and so something like um this isn't sorry this isn't newness but like uh people are obsessed with the idea that of like the first woman director in a certain cr country like the M Marta Mezaros the first um Hungarian woman director in it, to make a feature film it's just not true there have been like there were like five before her I think also it does it's it um like you, it it doesn't um, acknowledge all the women that were like editing, um, scre screenwriting, and I think that's another thing that another gaze tries to get away from is it just being director focused. Um, but yeah, it's like why are we drawn to these uh, like making these claims? I think it's just laziness. I think it's shorthand, and I think it's like this person, this woman is important because she was the first. But it's like. I don't think she would ever necessarily would have described herself in that way. And Marta Majoras has never said that. And I think it's very wrong to um, force these claims onto a woman who can't, a woman filmmaker who's either dead or like can't answer to all of these. I think, it, I think, um, yeah, framing and complex framing is just like so important. And I, and yeah, the more I, the more I see um, women being programmed, the more like disappointed I am with all the different, uh, yeah like it's, it's a, the temptation is like really strong like Cecilia Mangini like actually as far as I know was the first woman um to make documentaries in Italy but I never I never s wrote that on the site because I just thought that that would be the first thing that people were drawn to and and like if anyone wrote about the program that would be the thing that they said and I I wanted to make life difficult for the people writing about the works um yeah so that's not really but I need to think more about newness you're right and that's really thank you <laughs> I wonder if there's time for one more question, if there is one. An illegal one? Yeah. What's the password for? <laughs> Oh well, I did actually. <laughs> yeah, read the review on read the review on another uh, gaze because it actually says. Um, although it's true that I did foist a lot of my opinions onto that writer, which is like not good editorial practice. Um, and there's one thing that I really strongly agree, uh, disagree with in that piece uh, comes towards the end. But like, uh, I think yeah. I mean, I can't even like yeah. I just just read that piece because it says it much better than I can articulate it. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure people caught it. It was the review of the the <laughs> um, the worst person in the world, in the world. which uh, I think had quite a big impact. I definitely had uh, uh, had several conversations with people in Oslo that just had this huge sense of relief after reading that article. I think that <laughs> were. Did, did we invite Joachim Trier to come to this one? Is but no, but again, it is to do with newness. I think like the idea that this is a new, newly like a complex female character and I hate this idea of complexity when it comes to uh, women characters as well because there's even in like in some incredibly misogynistic um male filmmakers of like the, yeah and the 60s there, there are some complex women there can be some complex women characters in that and that's because uh the actresses are authors like authors in their own right but yeah the idea that this was refreshing and new um just uh yeah drove me a bit mad because it the film it most reminded me of and this is what actually what Laura includes that in her thing and I said uh was 500 days of summer I don't know if you <laughs> remember this film but like it's like I think it's from the film from where the idea of the manic pixie dream girl was coined um and I think it's much more fun watch than <laughs> the worst person in the world so but I'm really excited to reenact the last scene uh in the bar with everyone <laughs> afterwards <laughs> I'll get out. I've got my camera. I can pretend to be the photographer. Um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> Maybe that's a good note on yeah, which yeah, to finish to, to say. Um, if, if you'd like to, to help Daniela restage that, maybe buy her a beer. Can you, um, you, should, you should come and join. We're going to stick around, I think. Uh, Has anyone, have I ever slept with anyone in the audience and do they have a child now with someone else? They need to, sta <laughs> <laughs> they need to stand out front <laughs> and I will, <laughs> I will look at them and be like, it's okay because I have my career. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We There are four copies, I think, in Norway of Another Gaze, and they are in this building. So if you would like them, you can um, get them on the desk and you can vips a number, which will say it's going to me, but I promise it's going to go to Daniela afterwards. <laughs> so it's okay.